All right, good afternoon, everyone. We have our next presenter, Mrs. Jean Leslie and Dr. Clement Leslie. And as you will see in your, your program, we will not get into the details of, the, of, of their profile, but we're going to get straight into the presentation for the interest of time. So help me welcome both Mrs. Leslie and Mr. Leslie. Dr. <laughs> uh, Dr. Leslie, Dr. Leslie. No, that's, 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 you're going to get us in serious. Beer. That's Mr. Yeah. Leslie sitting here. My name is Lambert. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. wasn't the best start. Best start. <laughs> We're not married. That's Mr. Leslie sitting here. <laughs> Let me just keep myself clear. <laughs> so, so, I guess I might have to change the presentation to what are our stories. <laughs> the whole idea is that, well, we, I met Mrs. Wesley years ago. She was one of my grad students, and they, I, she embarked on a very interesting study. She did background research and then uh, her competences were actually, she was an administrator, she still is an administrator, but then she had interested in, 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 in literacy and she was a brilliant graduate student. So, and selected a very interesting area. So, this whole study was intended to provide actually uh, insights on the experiences of some adult adult literacy persons, adult laborers who actually were employed in a university setting and also to link their experiences and their literacy development narratives to TVET. Of course, literacy in Jamaica will go hand in hand since the post slavery, post colonial era, and even during slavery. Uh, and of course, literacy, as we all know, has been a key determinant for mobility within our context. Uh, I don't think I'll be here hadn't it been for interesting and many of you. Our parents actually imposed on us that, that we needed to do conventional reading and writing in order to, and, and I was lamenting to one of my colleagues that maybe if TVET had that kind of emphasis, I'd be a richer man today. <laughs> <laughs> the, whole, the whole idea is that literacy is very important, but even in TVET, it's very important to have, have literacy competences and so, of course, in the 21st century, we know, we have seen all the keynote presentations, I will not go into that dimension. But then, of course, we have the historical perspective where, where missionaries came here and they said they were teaching us to read or because they wanted to Christianize us. And then after that, it evolved in, 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 as a necessity after post-colonial times. And of course we know the whole notion of literacy campaign of the 1970s, Jamal. I remember some of the ads with the lantern and you're going to step out of the darkness and into the light or you're going to equalize of yourself with literacy. It is a, it is a means for advancement and, 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 and so on. But Jamal then eventually evolved into JFLL, lifelong learning, and there was a significant shift with all the high school equivalency exams and all and, and, and standards to, to, to lifelong learning. And also, even now, over 10% of the Jamaican populace, adult populace, they are, they are deemed to be illiterate or they are not functionally literate. And female adult literacy rates globally is higher than male. So, but of course, the goalpost has also changed because when when Jamal came about in the 70s, we knew we knew that they wanted us to be basically illiterate. We should be able to sign our withdrawal forms from the bank and pay our light bills and stuff like that. We don't even sign withdrawal forms anymore. We swipe our cards. So the, the whole goalpost has changed. We have we need to be digital literate. We also need to be multiliterate. We have multiliteracy these days where we have to be able to, to, to actually be a part of that digital environment. So, and that's very important for us in this time. But of course, there's also the affective dimension, the whole attitude to reading and to literacy, and also the need to explore how texts position itself with others. And, and, and that we, we don't only deal with functional literacy now, but we deal with transactions. 
and, and recursive relationships. But there are also greater opportunities to produce and consume texts. No longer are we writing letters and, and mailing them, but we are, we, are, we are creating things instantaneously. I have been posting so many things on my WhatsApp status since I came here. So I'm not a digital, a digital composer rather than, rather than a consumer. And also the changing nature of meaning making. Things have changed so much over the years. We, we see in the US the whole night idea of taking Mr. Biden to the coals. Because he, because he was too touchy feely, they claim, and so so the whole landscape has changed. So what 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 is seen was seen in one way years ago is not seen in that way anymore. So we need to we need to actually move with the times, and also in terms of TVET, Jamaica seems to actually embrace a parallel model more, and of course there is a critical role of TVET economic growth. And, and so on. And my favorite one at the end is that <laughs> Tibet has become a critical and growing concern in Jamaica and the Caribbean, and the authors are right. There's Dr. <laughs> Dr. Ferguson more right there. So, so, the, so the whole idea is that the Tibet has pervaded the landscape in this, in this millennium. Well, we looked at our study and the, we, we decided to embrace a qualitative paradigm and, and and the whole idea is that we're looking at the stories of these adult learners. And we thought that we, we didn't need to get a whole lot of, our questions dictated the approach that we took, because we wanted to find out what their experiences were within the work environment. And we, we were more process oriented. So we, we collected data through interviews, and sometimes it also became therapeutic interviews in the process. <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea, what we'll hear some, some more about that later. And also, we, we used inductive and inductive process, a process of coding there. And member checks, we, we, we were sure to go back to the adult learners to find out if that is what they really said and what they really meant. And also collegial audit peers among, peers among us looked at the, at the data and, and, and we did checks to see whether or not our, our analyses were, were spot on. And I'll turn over to Mrs. Leslie. And she is actually the principal researcher so she will have to continue first. And so, in as much as this morning, uh, the conversation surrounded us not wanting to label uh, research, but rather to get in it and see what's going on, it was felt, and we agreed with Miriam, that qualitative, we are more interested in how the people interpret their experiences. That's basically what qualitative research is about. How do they construct their worlds? And the, and the meanings they attribute to their experiences. It provides a more in-depth description of their lives as adult laborers, and so that persons may identify commonalities and are able to relate these to other persons and other contexts. So coming out of this, we recognize that it was more them telling their story. It was more a, a narrative experience and according to Rodriguez, personal narratives can offer ways to explore multiplicity and complexity of social identities. It provides insights into various dimensions of the participants' lives. So by just them telling us their stories, in as much as you would have had questions for the interviews, the probing, the, the, the relaxed space you put them in, you get so much more from the experience. So it spans the personal and professional knowledge landscapes of individuals, according to Connelly and What were the ethical considerations? Now, remember now, these are people's stories, people's lives, and this is a place of work. The fear of us retelling their story would have been real, so that we would have had to, from, from the beginning, got their consent. Informed consent was very crucial. We, we had to let them know that you can leave at any time. And one might say, leave at any time? Is this an ongoing process? It was an ongoing process because of, as Lambert said a while ago, the member checking. We had to go back to them every now and again for clarification. We got signed consent, and we ensured that their real names were not used. So having done the interviews, we returned to them, share what the findings were, read it back to them, 
and ascertain is that really what, what you meant when you said so and so. Five participants were used, and just to share with you a little about them, the table shows that two, two were in their 50s, one in their 40s, and two in their 30s. The gender breakdown is representative of the workers present here, more males than females. This is facilities management. Uh, mostly from lower socioeconomic backgrounds, large families, they were from large families, but with time, they flipped the story by having smaller numbers of children that they can manage, with the exception of Josie, who just always felt that the, the more, the merrier. <laughs> so it, it's almost for her, it's, and, and we will realize from other stories, it's almost vicariously living through the, the children. So whatever it is that they did not achieve, they are trying through the children. Another thing that came out, another thing that was common, different types of abuse. For some, for some, they had parental neglect. One of the cases, straight abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse. But, uh, but others, like the males, in, in one case, two cases, nuclear family, Parents, you know, parents were present, but they said, we just got a company. So that was one of their explanations for not excelling more than they did. So one of the purposes was to receive salient information about their school experiences. Most of them remembered very little about the time they spent in school. In the case of Kate, who experienced most of the abuse. Her reaction was, I really don't remember a thing about that. I can tell you about being in the yard where my family lived, she said. I think the only reason my mother had me was to take care of the other kids. I mastered that. That's what my mother had me for. Kate's story, when it began, Kate said, you know, I'm not afraid to tell you that I cannot read any of the signs around here. I just can't. I can't. So her journey began with molestation at four because her parents, her mother, her father died when she was one year old and her mother left her with four siblings at the time. And that kind of sum up her early days. So for her, schooling was almost like a game of hide and seek. She was in today, out tomorrow, based on how finances came about. For Josie, I didn't stay until the end. She, she grew up in rural Jamaica. She left Peace Grove Primary and went to Greytown All Age. So you'll notice even the names of the schools are pseudonyms. She went barefooted, she said. No shoes, not even a bag. I had to take my books in my hand. No one gave me anything, not even lunch money. I had to work for it. Like on Saturdays, I would do house cleaning and earn money. So, single parent again, most of her siblings were with their fathers. But for her, the sister who followed her, were she and that one were the only ones at home. She experienced a lot of parental neglect. Her mom worked on the estate, the sugar estate, but I'm not so sure if it would be reasonable to interpret how the mother actually felt about parenting and taking care of them. But she said she grew up at a time when uniforms were provided by the school. Food, well, they never really had food, but the teachers would help out. But even so, the uniforms were not made. So you got the fabric to make the uniform. Uniforms were not made. She, come, she said she left basic school and had to walk herself to the primary school to get registered. Bart said most of the times he didn't have much money. Sometimes he had to beg teachers for lunch. And then he started to get some amount of pride. So he, he really couldn't bother to stress out the teachers. And that led to him disappearing from school. 
Bobby said that the main thing with him was that when he went to school, he was expelled, he was expelled twice. School was different from now. If you talk back to the teachers, they would put you out of school. <laughs> I must let you all know that the presentation of the narratives have, has been sanitized because it was straight Creole. And I'm not so sure how that would have done for internationalization. So we had to clean it up somewhat. So, right, so he was relating that if you if you back answered, um, put differently, if you spoke out of turn, teacher would tell you, don't come back. Moses, Moses recalled leaving basic school and going on to the primary school of the same name. And he felt that everything was going well until they moved his twin brother to another class. For him, he said it was like he just couldn't learn again. He couldn't stay in the class alone. He was just always thinking about the brother. Because for him, being five minutes older, he was responsible for his younger twin. I don't think they should separate twins, even if they don't look alike, as long as their birth certificates show that they are twins, they should stay together. And this is an interesting story. One of my colleagues has triplets. And when they got GSAT, I think two were placed at one school, traditional school, and one some places. All traditional schools though. And one of the boys just wouldn't have it. He said to the parents, if we can't all the same place, I'm staying home. And they had to do the ministry runs and everything until everything worked out that they, all three boys were together. We tried to find out from them how they actually felt about the school experience. Moses continued by saying he didn't like how teachers dealt with children who were frequently absent. They didn't take the child aside and help them to catch up. So if you were not so bright and ready, you don't continue to slide down the boy. No improvement, no encouragement, absolutely nothing. It was just like I went to school because the government said parents should send their children to school. He went on. But really and truly, what did I learn? When you check it out, I didn't really learn anything. Even right now, I can't help myself that much. From the themes having to do with schooling, there were tendencies of them forgetting the experience. The, the recollection was patchy. So we felt that it would be interesting to explore why they had very little recollection. So I'm trained in facilities management and information systems. I did a minor in my undergraduate years in, in, days in human resource development, but it doesn't make me a sociologist. <laughs> Neither does it make Clement Lambert one, or a psychologist. So to try to explore we felt would be good for somebody else to, to take on. Poverty was, was a common theme. It was a chief player in the stories of schooling, bare necessities led to them being absent in their childhood lives. The, the, they complained that the, the school system seemed to have been a failure. Very little was described that catered to the needs of the participants. And we heard one individual saying, if you weren't at school, there was no attempt to take you back on stream. And there was some amount of suspicion that we later uh, called adult conspiracy, adult conceptions amongst the males. There was an irrational idea of high external locus of control. One of the ways in which that was manifested, Bart in his interview said when, the, when nurses came to school for vaccines, for example, he would hide away. He wouldn't participate in that because it just, he just felt that the white people wanted to do something to us black people. So it's that, it's that kind of conceptions that even moved into the classroom. So Bobby said he was one of the school children. There you go. <laughs> so those white people in America and England didn't mean black people any good, you see. They will even put things in the vaccine to affect our learning or whatsoever it might be. 
because they had techniques, you know. And later on, another of them, in talking about the techniques, talk now about the new millennium, that when the millennium was coming on, the amount of things they said. And so right now, because of this millennium bug and the computers, we are now forcing them, employers are forcing them to go back to school. So can you imagine living in a yard where people are molesting you like it's a normal thing? Don't you see it's only God who's helping me to stay strong? Your father's brother. Remember, you know, it was my father's brother. There were two first brothers, one mother. It's the same mother's child. I'm just showing you that things in life, that when I went through them, I'm supposed to be insane. But by God's help, I'm still here. So that is uh, Kate again. Security of tenure continues to bother them because literacy is necessary for them to gain full-time employment. So these casual laborers, some are street, uh, sweeping, some sweep the institution, drain cleaning, or just paying handyman services. And what do handymen do? Like packing out this room, things like those. In the case of Josie, she, she constantly says that she tells her children to get an education because it's the key. They can turn around and help her to do better in later days. So right now, if I'm doing anything, I'm not sure of the spelling, then they can help me. Boy, Jamal was really good, you know. I got to know certain words. I want to tell you that even my Bible has started to read, but after a time, it just locked down. They all have aspirations. Moses felt that after a while, he started to feel like he wanted to learn to read, especially because of his children. So children is one of their uh, motivating factors. There's a need to connect with God. So I'm wrapping up. Two themes dominated, self-aspiration and aspirations for their children. Bart being at almost 50, still wants to own his own business, but feels like he's crippled because of the need for the hard certification. TVET has and can be both exclusionary and inclusionary. Provides a coherent profile and direction for 21st century learners and career pathways. It begs the question, how adequately are the needs of struggling adult learners being catered to? The child in homes and social conditions of struggling adult learners seem to weigh more heavily and social, more heavily on their recollections of hindrances to learning. There needs to be a greater national focus to promote improvement of these conditions. We're recommending that greater emphasis on individualized and self-paced learning be done for adult learners. There seems to be a strong case for implementing family literacy programs to promote adult literacy. And other programs to promote literacy learning should be more holistic, including psychological and other necessary interventions. Policies linking certification and security of tenure need to be revisited to ensure that equity and fairness are not compromised. I'd just like to also add that while we contemplate how we might be able to help these learners, some of the strategies that our people started to use at work include less voice instructions and more written instructions, so that this is forcing them to read. So for example, something as simple as, can you please check how many tablecloths are there and organize them by what's wrong, what's rectangular, big work. What, what, you know, and so on. And there's some amount of struggle, but here what I'd like for you to do for me. When you're finished, please write it and bring it back. And when, when it's written and returned, read for me what you have. So it's a one-on-one, -on -one, so that's working. Another thing, less of the voice notes and more of the texting. I have been ignoring voice notes. I got a message from one today and they, and I texted back and said, I'm not able to listen at the moment. And the person replied, put in ear space. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the strategy is my rules. And just as we have work of the month, student of the quarter and so on, I believe we can move to using strategies like those for those who are not so literate to encourage them to do more of the reading. And that's our... Peace. We're open for questions and answers if we're allowed by Mr. Nelson. Yes, uh, I was about to say that um, it's very interesting 
could have give if I have time, I could have given you five or ten more minutes, but the interest of time doesn't allow us. But we use an opportunity now of three minutes to take a Q and A and each person is required to state their names and their affiliated organization. So the floor is open now for question and answer. Three minutes. Uh, Paul Cochrane, Workforce Opportunities and Residency Cayman, Cayman Islands. Um, my question, um, having interacted and spent that great deal of time with, the, with your colleagues, and the, how do you see a program or what kind of program do you see beneficial to them to moving towards what you're starting to do as a person? But to get them to move to the point where you see the, the spoke to the aspirations on islands, you can make is there something that you see them going to, or is it a program that needs to now be developed to cater to that level of literacy or lack of literacy to bring them to another level so that they can? Move there are programs that exist to the JFL, but some of them are very old. They're, they've been ex in existence from the seventies and they've not been. Totally revised, so you'll see books in black and white. And also, if, if we had more time, we'd have spoken about their reaction to these programs. Okay. Well, they spoke about proximity, how tired they are after working mm -hmm. to be able to go to the centers and concentrate. Others, how they feel about working in groups. Mm -hmm. Some are not comfortable working in groups, they prefer to be, have a one on one tutoring. So, the, the whole idea is that we've tried programs. But as you mentioned, it's not going to be a one size fits all anymore. There needs to be more. Um, as she's doing, coaching of persons who deal with them on the workplace to actually provide some literacy experience in this area to build their confidence, and then after all, they might be able to fit in more confidence. We try to work on this older couple as older. Sorry. Could you remind uh, me of your name? Sure or she wants, she wants name and I'm oh, sorry, Diane. Um, workforce opportunities <laughs> resident to Kenya and uh, Diane Kong. Right. Um, we actually uh, tried a similar program trying to do a uh, literacy one, a small group. We kept it to five um, as our pilot program. Um, with ACT, which is an online animated um, version. Uh, so they started where they work. It is a free assessment to help us get them up. And um, after six months, we only had one person. <laughs> uh, but that person was able to come back and say, I, I'm working in the shops. I can actually read what I'm putting away now. Um, but out of five, you know, we still. <laughs> Another important dimension you mentioned was family literacy, yeah. where where the family comes together and they learn together. Mm -hmm. right? Because the whole idea is that parents still want to help their children, and also children will read to their parents. So configure it in a way that the family will learn together rather than adults learn in isolation. Yeah, but you had a gentleman who was 55 years old, 60 yeah. years old, and he didn't want everybody to know. Yeah. Right. But they are asking for strategies, so strategies that would include it's happening at the workplace. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're saying that among themselves, it's as if they have a club. They know yes. each other. So they are comfortable among themselves. They have been developing strategies in the bank and so on to handle matters. So that if we were to have sessions, they suggest two hours after work, immediately after work, and give them package homework for the weekend, they would be glad to come out for that. But even though the Jamaica Foundation for Lifelong Learning has a facility within 15 minutes of where some of them live and of where some of them work, they're not going out there for it. So we just have to try the things that was the Just, just uh, my name is uh, Justin Pierre. I'm from the Barnabas Associated Science. I just, I'm very, very interested in the presentation. I think that um, it kind of resonates some of, some of the experience we had in, in doing our, our study. We found that persons who are in, let's say, they are kind of reading and writing. Do they, what sort of, do they have a, do, do you have any experience where they're having, they have a very closer tie or closer end, um, of, uh, emphasis for their children to, to not be in their situation? Oh yes, oh yes. Notice Joseph's remark. Oh my God. 
that I tell my children that education is the key. And this is common among them. So they do everything to get your children. So in Joseph's case, she has one child, one son was already completed college. One was doing engineering now. Uh, another in high school, does shot putting for her institution and so on. So she only has three children in school, but she talks, she's living through them. Right, 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 right. Most of our conversations are about the children, and the others will tell you the same thing. In the case of in the case of Bart, he was relating how his daughter works with a top insurance company in the country. And, and do you, do you, so, do you, so they really try to take their children. Do you have any idea of what, maybe what percentage of, of persons who live the life before the children from, from your experience? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, and also, lastly, um, the adverse childhood experiences like you know, rape, incest, and things like that. Yes. Um, these two persons, do you, um, I, I think that, do you know any any have any data on of these persons who were, uh, who had um, let's say higher low um, base score, who children are experiencing the same? That's a great suggestion for further research. Yeah. I, think, I think that um, yes. I think that something that I would be interested in. Okay. But if you are interested in maybe uh, doing a research like that, right. maybe you could talk to me later. Okay, absolutely. We'll Sounds take your right. money. But this particular parent, she's very protective of her children, right. not even the father does she allow to interact with. <laughs> because we, we we are it's very interested how people. Because um, we, 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 uh, we did a study and persons will, will, who had like, some of these experiences will, will never leave the children. Mm -hmm. Right, said, you know, so that's her story. I will never ever leave my, the side of my, my child again because of what I went through. Yeah. Let's wrap it up now. We have over. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thanks again.